The Cave at the End of the World by Chris Powling Illustrated by Amerigo Pinelli 1. Tig's Picture Tig and her big brothers stared at the icy landscape ahead. Even from here, the wildness seemed full of danger. Behind them, huddled against the slopes of the mountain, was the warmth and comfort of the camp. It looked like the last safe place on Earth. Had they wandered too far from home? We've been out all day, Tig, Uga said. It'll soon be dark. Shall we go back? Not yet, said Tig. She glanced down at the marks she'd made. No, not marks. They were more than that a complete picture she'd drawn in the mud. With a dozen quick strokes of her stick, she'd sketched a deer with horns so enormous they looked like the tangled branches of a tree. Uga recognized the animal at once. That's really clever, he told her. Just lots of practice, Tig shrugged. Uga knew this was true. Tig wasn't like most girls. She didn't want to be a homemaker or a gatherer or to plant the crops which helped keep the tribe alive. She didn't want to be a fighter or a hunter like her brother and the other boys either. Uga sighed and shook his head. He already knew the answer, but he asked the question anyway. So what do you want to do when you are older, Tig? There must be something you fancy. I want to make pictures like this one. That's all? I want to draw the animals that live in the wildness. The bears and the bison, the lions and horses, the mammoths and rhinos and reindeer. But the bighorn deer is my favorite. Tig jabbed at the outline she'd just sketched. It's the antlers I like best, she said. They're so huge and heavy. Maybe too heavy, Uga laughed. It's a wonder the poor thing can hold up its head. It was the wrong thing to say. Tig hated the idea that one of her beloved animals had a fault. She scowled and turned away. Soon, her big brother had to trot to keep up with her as she hurried home, slashing the air with her stick as if it were a whip. Uga liked animals, too. He really did, but he also liked snuggling up in a pile of their thick, furry skins. The animals from the wildness gave everyone clothes and shelter, didn't they? Add a good fire in the middle of the tent with a hunk of meat roasting over it, and the animals gave them food as well. Yes, the wildness did sometimes feel like the end of the world, but what better place could there be for a tribe like theirs? And yet, Uga looked back over his shoulder. Tig's deer picture was out of sight now, but he knew it was something special. Was that why Mom and Dad always smiled and nudged each other when they saw her latest sketch? Every line of Tig's drawings was always just as it should be. How long do they last, though? By tomorrow, the wind and the rain from the wildness would have wiped out every sign of Tig's skill. Out in the open, a drawing in mud or sand lasted a day or two at most. So what was the point of doing it? 2. The Old Man of the Mountain Night had fallen by the time Tig and Uga reached home. Already, in the cool of the evening, a fire had been lit inside every tent. I can smell supper, said Uga. Me too, said Tig. They heard the tent flaps scrape back. Quickly, Dad beckoned them inside. We have a guest, he said. An honored guest, Mum added. A grateful guest, came a voice that creaked like an old tree. In the glow of the fire, their visitor looked a bit like an old tree, too. His hair had a twiggy, leafy scruffiness. His hands were rough and stained. And what were those blobs of red, white, gray, brown, and black on his clothes? Ah, he said. Uga and Tig at last. 
I'm pleased to meet you. Tig, especially. Me? said Tig. I've been hearing about your pictures, Tig. Carefully, with fingers as knobbly as a tree root, the old man smoothed out the ashes on the fringe of the fire. From his cloak, he took a stick sharpened at the tip. He held it towards her. Show me, he said. Show me your favorite drawing. Tig bit her lip. What if her hand slipped? What if, for once, the picture fell short of her best? She twiddled the stick to steady her nerves. Then practice took over. Flick, flick, flick for the antlers. Dab, dab, dab for the head and the body. Smudge, smudge, smudge for the mystery of the finished animal. The sketch of the bighorn deer seemed to leap out of the ashes as suddenly as the real-life creature might leap out of the grass in the wildness. From the tangle of its huge horns to the flash of its hard-edged hooves, it made Tig herself gasp at how beautiful it was. See? she exclaimed in delight. What do you think? The old man was sitting as still as a hunter on the lookout. This time, when he finally spoke, his voice was more hoarse than creaky. Perfect, he managed to say. Just perfect. 3. Uga Tries to Sleep The old man didn't stay long after supper. I must get back to my den, he insisted. The mountain isn't easy to climb in the dark. Especially now the rain has begun. But first... Yes, said Tig. First we must make a plan. A plan? Uga could hardly believe what he heard the old man tell Tig next. The plan was simple. His sister was to set off at dawn next morning to visit the old man's den. Let the bear tracks guide you. He told her. Come alone, Tig. I want to test how keen you are to make pictures. Do you understand? Tig had nodded. And so, amazingly, had Mum and Dad. They shook the old man's hand and hugged him goodbye, as if he were family. Did they know something that Uga didn't? No wonder Tig's brother couldn't sleep. He tossed and turned on his bed of animal skins, struggling to shut out the endless drumming of the rain on the tent roof. Half the night had passed before he closed his eyes, and even then he began to dream. Tig was in the dream, of course. So was the bighorn deer, though now it seemed to tower over her full size. No glimpse of the strange old man, though, Almost no glimpse, anyway. Uga couldn't help noticing how much the nightmare had changed his little sister. For instance, her leafy, twiggy hair, and the worn-out roughness of her hands. Most creepy of all, what were those blobs of red, white, gray, brown, and black all over her clothes? 4. Following the Bear Tracks Tig set off at dawn, as agreed. Not that it felt like dawn. With the low-hanging cloud and the still-falling rain, it was more like the last of the night shadows. She pulled up her hood and clutched at her cape to keep the chill and the damp at bay. What about bears, though? If there were bear tracks to follow, and she could see them ahead of her, there had to be bears, yes? But what kind of bear would be out on the prowl in weather like this? It would have to be a bear so hungry it would rip a girl like her to... to shreds. Tig stopped dead. Slowly, she turned round on the spot. There were rocks and trees and scrub all round her now. It was as if the wildness had crept up on her unawares. Tig shuddered. I'll go back to camp, she thought to herself. That old man was crazy to talk me into this, and Dad and Mum were just as crazy when they agreed with him. 
yet they had agreed with him. She'd be letting them all down if she went home now. Even worse, she'd be letting herself down. Keep going, Tig, she whispered to herself. You can't give up yet. She could, though. She could have given up very easily when she heard the shuffle of something bulky in the undergrowth. On all fours, was it? On all four paws, to be exact. Tig didn't wait to find out. She pushed back her hood, bunched up her cape, and ran. Thorns snagged at her. Roots clutched at her. The track itself seemed to suck at her. As if it meant to trap her feet first, her ankles next, then bring her to a knee-deep standstill. Yes, there it was again, the faint pad-pad-pad of some creature gaining on her, step by step. Desperately, Tig plunged forward into a tangle of mountain scrub. She caught the sizzle of a lightning strike in the trees further down the slope. Thunder rumbled across the wildness as the storm began to build. A moment later, Tig tripped and fell flat and went on falling. Had the rock face opened up under her? Had she pitched headlong into some kind of tunnel? Arms flailing, feet scuffing on stones and scrabble, Tig finally slithered to a halt. She rolled over and propped herself on her elbows. Her eyes began to adjust to the darkness, but her ears adjusted first. Yes, there it was above her, the same pad-pad padding as before. A scatter of pebbles landed on her head and shoulders. The bare thing, or whatever it was, had crept after her into the tunnel. She gave a howl of terror. There was nothing she could do. She pulled her hood over her head, curled up as tightly as she could, and braced herself for the attack. 5. The Cave at the End of the World Tig? Tig lifted her head. Had she heard her own name? What kind of bear hisses your name before it sinks its teeth in you? Tig! There it was again. Definitely her name. Fear must have driven her mad. It was the only explanation. You had to be mad to believe in a talking bear. Please just kill me and do it quickly, she groaned. Tig, is that you? Uga? Tig pushed back her hood. Barely visible in the gray-black gloom, her brother's hand brushed her cheek. I'm sorry, Tig. I know the mountain man said you must follow the tracks by yourself, but I just couldn't let it happen. You might have met a bear. Yeah, said Tig. A talking bear. What? Never mind. Tig, where are we? It feels like some sort of cave. Why did you come down here? I didn't exactly do it on purpose. Ruefully, Tig rubbed her bruises. Without her heavy cape and the thickness of the skins she wore, these might have been a lot worse. She and her brother had been lucky, she realized. Up till now, anyway. Maybe their luck had already run out. Tig? Uga said suddenly. He pointed, and Tig followed his gaze. Beyond them, deep in the cave's dimness, they saw a flicker of light. A torch! Was it the kind of torch the tribe made from roots and animal fat to help them hunt at night? It's him, Tig told her brother. The mountain man? This is his den, Tig said. It must be. The torchlight bobbed and dipped towards them, sometimes disappearing altogether as it ducked under a jutting rock or rounded a pillar of stone. Before long... They could smell the thin, sour smoke of it. Two of you? Rasped a creaky old voice they recognized at once. Didn't I tell you to come alone, Tig? I'm her big brother. Uga snapped. I decided otherwise. 
You did, did you? Yes, I did. For a moment, lit by the slow-burning torch, the old man and the young man stared angrily at each other. Then Tig tugged at the old man's sleeve. You can trust him, she said. He was just protecting me the way he always does. He'll keep your den secret, I promise. You think so? I know he will, said Tig firmly. The old man of the mountain stepped back. He looked Uga up and down. Not got much choice, have I? He growled. Watch where you're treading, both of you, and stay as close to me as you can. This wasn't easy in the light of a single torch. At first, they bumped and jostled each other till the old man kindled two more torches in the embers of a dying fire. Hold them upright, he said. They'll burn more slowly. Tig and Uga peered nervously into the shadows. What little they could see was scary. Bones, Tig exclaimed. There are bones everywhere. Nothing but bones and skulls and sticking up ribs. Do creatures come here to die? Uga asked. Mostly to sleep, replied the old man. See those hollows where the floor's worn away? They're bear pits. For grizzlies and their cubs to snooze away the winter till spring returns. Other creatures too? If the bears let them? Tig sighed. Lots of animals are dangerous, I know. Deadly even, but I still prefer them alive and wide awake. So do I, child. The old man halted and lifted his torch. He cupped a hand to his ear and listened a moment. Hear that? No, said Uga. Hear what? Tig shook her head. It's the storm gathering outside, getting fiercer bit by bit. This mountain will soon be on the slide, I shouldn't wonder. Neither of them had heard a sound, just a deep, stony middle-of-the-mountain silence. Uga pulled a face and whispered, Is the old man all right, Tig? The old man is fine, came the tree-creaky voice up ahead. And his hearing is better than yours. Now, are you coming with me? Lose yourself in this place, and you'll be lost forever. Where are you taking us? Tig asked. To see some animals. You mean live animals? Wide awake animals? The old man chuckled. <laughs> you tell me, Tig. They're as alive and as wide awake as I can make them. He was still chuckling as he hobbled off. 6. The Bighorn Deer Sometimes the cave narrowed like a trap closing in on them. At other times, it opened like a funnel, eager to swallow them up. Twisting and turning, half crouching and half clambering, Tig and Uga stumbled after the old man. He did slow down every so often to let them catch up. Twice, he had to relight their torches when they dropped them. Don't worry, he said gruffly. We'll soon be there. Where was there, though? They had no idea. But they knew the instant they'd arrived. Tig and Uga gasped in astonishment. The old man of the mountain had propped a line of torches across a stretch of rock to show them where to look. He had been as good as his word. No painted animals on a painted wall could have been more alive and more wide awake than these were. Bears and bison, lions and horses, mammoths and rhinos and reindeer. They seemed to run and jump and breathe at you in every possible shade of red, white, gray, brown, and black. All the creatures in the wildness you could wish for, he murmured. Except one, said Tig. Except one, the old man smiled. He pointed at an empty wall space. 
It was just the right size and just the right shape for a big horned deer. What followed was the happiest time of Tig's life. The old man had shown her his painting tools, and she carefully chose one. Of course, she'd never used proper tools before or worked with a proper artist. But these made the job much easier than mud and a sharpened stick. Soon, with every flick, dab, and smudge, she could match the painting skills of the old man himself. With its spiky horns and lowered head, her deers seemed to be charging full tilt at the majestic troop of animals just ahead of it. I could do this day in and day out, Tig sighed. So what's stopping you? N you mean here? She blinked. With you? With me, yes, but not in this place. You still can't hear the noise? That slithery sound overhead? This cave is about to be sealed off, Tig. Ask your brother. You've been far too busy to notice him hopping from one foot to the other like a cat in a cooking pot. What can you hear, Uga? It's the start of a landslip, said Uga grimly. I'm sure of it. We'll be buried alive if we're not quick. Then we'd better be quick, the old man said. Seven, thirty thousand years underground. They took an age to say goodbye to Tig's big horned deer. They took another age to pack up the painting gear and trim what was left of their torches. As for returning to the tunnel, this took the longest age of all. With every heartbeat, Uga expected the mountain to come thundering down on top of them. Hurry up, he wanted to say. Hurry up! Even out in the open air again, the old man still teased them as he strolled away from the cave's entrance at a snail's pace. We got the timing just about right, he winked. Don't look away now, or you'll miss the show. They almost did miss it. While the sky began to turn blue above the dripping trees, they watched boulders shift, Stones splinter, and the foot of the mountain spread wider and wider as the landslide struck. The tunnel's covered up, Tig wailed. And so are the pictures. Still there, though, said the old man. Just hidden. Hidden for how long? Hard to say. But I guess someone will find another entrance into the cave. In about a thousand years. A thousand years? Or ten, or twenty, or thirty thousand years, Tig. Who knows? And what does it matter? It's our gift to the people who come after us whenever they discover it. They'll see what used to be here in the wildness. A picture of the past they can keep forever. Better than a few scratches in the mud, Uga grinned. That lasts only a day or two, added Tig. Her eyes had a faraway look. Already she was dreaming of other tunnels, other caves at the end of the world, and other painted animals whose pictures were so protected they would never disappear. With the old man to train her and Uga to guard her, what more could she wish for than that? The cave at the end of the world. Tig doesn't want to be like the other children. She wants to draw. But is she good enough to join the mountain man? <laughs>